Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another Flutter tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at Firebase Storage. Firebase Storage is a way of storing larger files that aren't just strings or data into Firebase. If you create a Firebase project and you go into the Develop panel here and click Storage, this will open up the storage part of the Firebase console and you can click Get Started and it will automatically give you a basic set of rules. The default rules require that a user logs in. Now because we're not going to deal with authentication in this particular application, I'm just going to delete this line here and hit publish and it will complain that the security rules are set to public and that anybody can read and write from the storage bucket. And we can just dismiss that and we should be all right. I've already gone ahead and integrated Firebase into this application. If you want to know how to do this, make sure you just go and check out one of the other Firebase tutorials that we've done in the past. Inside of our PubSpec YAML, we want to add Firebase storage to our application. So we just put in Firebase underscore storage. And the current version for this library is 0.3.5. So that's the version that I will be using. Also, because we're going to be dealing with photographs, I've brought in three different wallpaper photographs and I put them into our assets here inside of the PubSpec YAML. You can see here that these photographs are just fairly large background images. I'm just using them as stand-ins and I've got three of them. If we come back into our main.dart file, we can take a look at the boilerplate. We've just got a basic stateless widget which builds out a material application. This points towards a stateful widget which creates an empty scaffold. We need to make a few imports here. We want to import Firebase storage. We need to import Dart typed data, and I'll explain why we need this in a bit. We also need Dart IO, which will help us create files and temporary files inside of our application. And we also want to bring in Dart async because we're going to be dealing with a lot of asynchronous functions. The UI for this application will be fairly basic. We'll have our scaffold with an app bar in it. Then we'll make a center, which will have a column inside of it. The column will have a row and then a container below it. And the row will have our three different images inside of it. And we'll be able to click on one of these images with a gesture detector. That image will be sent to storage. And then we'll be able to fetch that image using a floating action button. At the bottom of our application, let's create a list of strings which will be globally available to the rest of our application. These will just be the strings for the paths for our photographs. So our photographs are inside of the assets folder, inside of the photos folder, and then each one is called wallpaper one, two, and three. With this list now defined, we can come in here and map on the list and make it so that each of our images is inside of a gesture detector. And then we call to the path using an image.asset widget. Now we do want to make sure to limit the width of each of our images because they're rather large. So because we're going to have three sitting in a row, we want them to be limited to a width of 125 pixels. If we load up our application inside of our emulator, you can see this is what it currently looks like. This isn't very nice, so let's modify the main axis alignment for our column and for the row itself. So here we can modify the main axis alignment for the column, and we'll make it main axis alignment center. And then for the row, we can align it by giving it some space between. And here you can see now it's just sitting in the middle. Each one has a bit of padding in between them. For our container down here, we can define the color as colors black, and then we can give it a width and height of 150 and 150. And I also changed the column's main axis alignment to be spaced evenly so that we have some nice space between this box here and then the photos up here. So basically, when the user clicks on one of these, it gets sent to storage, and then we'll have a floating action button down here that the user can then click, which will then download the photo and put it into our container here. So here we go, I've created our floating action button. I've just made it so that the on press does nothing. And then we've got our child, which will just be an icon that's just cloud download. So yeah, this is just the basic scaffold for our application. Now let's build out the logic which will allow us to send our files to and from storage. We wanna bring in a few more libraries. So we want to bring in Flutter services and specifically show root bundle. This is what's going to allow us to gain access to the actual files that are inside of our assets photos folder. 
We also want to bring in Dart Math, which is going to let us randomize the file names. This will come in handy as you'll see. Let's start by creating a function called upload file. This will take in a string file path and it will be asynchronous, so it will return a future null. First, we can get the bytes for our file by calling root bundle.load on the file path that we're sending into here. So this loads the file and gives us the file as bytes, specifically as byte data. This byte data type is why we brought in the typed data library for Dart. Now before we send our file to Firebase, we want to take the bytes and rewrite them into a temporary file. And we're going to do this by getting the temporary directory on our device. We do this by calling directory system temp and we can name this directory and I'm going to name it temp dir. So this will give us the actual path to the directory which we can store temporary files in. Now let's create a file name. So we want each of the files inside of this directory to have a random file name. And we can do this by calling random next integer and passing in 10,000. So the file name will be between 1 and 10,000. And because each of our files is actually a JPEG, we want to make sure to add that here as well into the file name. Now we can actually create the file by instantiating a new file on that directory. So we call our temp directory dot path and then we put the file name in front of it. Then we can actually write our byte data into this file by calling file dot write as bytes and then passing in bytes dot buffer dot as int eight list. And we want to set the mode for the file to file mode write so that we make sure that we have write access on this file. Now let's start adding in the storage logic. So this is all the storage logic that will allow us to push all of this into Firebase storage. We need to get a reference of our storage object. So we call Firebase storage instance dot ref. And then we specifically want to get the child, which will be the file name. So each of our files will be stored with this random file name dot JPEG on the actual storage server. And we can get that path by creating a storage reference like this. Then to actually upload the file, we can call ref.put file and then pass in the file that we created here. This creates what's called a storage upload task. And this is of course the task that is uploading our file to our storage bucket. Finally, we want to be able to get the download URI for this file. So each file that we upload will have a download URL attached to it. And we can do this by awaiting on the task and the future of the task. So we wait for the upload task to complete and then it gives us the download URL, which is a URI type. Now finally, to finish things off, we want to create a global variable, which will be a string and we'll call it path. And we'll take this download URL, we'll convert it into a string and we'll push it into this global variable. And just to verify, I'm going to print out the path so that you guys can see the actual download path itself. Now we can come down into our user interface in the gesture detector part and add an on tap event to each of our gesture detectors. This on tap event will take in an asynchronous function and inside of it we can await upload file and pass in the name, which is our file path. Just to clarify what this function actually does, we pass in the file path. The file path then allows us to get the file from our asset bundle. We then send the bytes from the asset bundle into a new temporary file that we create. And then we take that temporary file and we push it into the storage bucket in Firebase. So here now is our application. And if I click on one of these files, you can see it actually does write it to our Firebase. And down here we get the printout for the actual URI that we can ping to get this file back. So you can see here, it said Firebase storage.googleapis.com version 0b example project blah 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 blah. And then here's the actual file name which is 7955.jpg. And then there's a bunch of other stuff in here as well which would help us download the file if we wanted to do it that way. If we come into the actual storage bucket you can actually see the file that was downloaded. So here it is 7955.jpg. And this is just this file on the far left. If I click on this file and then I click on this file, these two should now appear inside of this storage bucket if we reload it. So now we have the three different files, each with three different sizes inside of our storage bucket. 
Now if we want to quickly just serve the file from Firebase Storage, we can do that. So we can just create a ternary operator inside of our container. Say if path does not equal null, then we want to create an image widget from the network and we just pass in our path. Otherwise we create an empty container. And this will work perfectly fine, except we're not calling set state when we're actually passing the new download URL into our path variable. And because of this, when I click on another photograph, it will not appear down here in the box unless we hot reload the actual application. Of course, we could fix this by simply calling set state at the end of this function. However, I'd rather download the actual file back into the temporary directory and then serve it to the application. So for this, we'll create a function called download file. This one will take in the HTTP path, which is the path that we're getting back here. And of course it's asynchronous, so we'll return a future null for this as well. Now to actually get the file inside of our application, we want to create a regular expression that will allow us to just grab this portion of the download URL that we get back from the first upload function. So we just need this word here, which is attached to .jpg. We can use this handy website to test to see if our regular expression is actually working. So this is called regexpr, and it's pretty useful for creating regular expressions. So here's how we're going to start our regular expression. We're going to start with a parenthesis, and then the first capturing set is this. Down here you can see the actual explanation for the capturing set. So this is a negated capture set, which means we do not want our first character to either be a forward slash or a question mark. We use the asterisk so that we make sure not to capture zero or more of the preceding token. Then we want a period to be attached to the thing that we're capturing. So we add a backslash and period to escape it. And then we're going to open another set of parentheses and we're going to type in here JPEG. And you can see here that the only part of the string that is being filtered out is this right here, which is the file path, which is exactly what we want. So let's copy that regular expression and then inside of our download file function, we'll create a new regular expression with this regular expression inside of it. We can then apply this regular expression to our HTTP path by calling string match on it and then passing in the HTTP path. And what this will do is it will filter through our HTTP path and then return the first match in the string that matches our regular expression. So this will be our file name. Then like before, we want to get our directory, so the temporary directory. We get this by calling directory.systemtemp. And then we want to create a file by taking our file name and attaching it to our temporary directory. So we're basically just grabbing the file that we created in our upload file here, and we're going to override it with the download information that we're pulling from Firebase Storage. To actually accomplish this part of it, we want to get our reference again. And because we have our file name, we can attach it to this part here in the child. And then we want to create what's called a storage file download task. We do this by calling ref.write to file. And this takes the actual file that we're pointing our reference to and then downloads it directly into our temporary cached file that we created before. Now we can go up to the top of our my homepage state state class and create a new file. We'll call this cached file. Then down inside of our download file function, what we'll do is we'll say final int byte number await download task dot future dot total byte count. And what this will do is it will wait until the download task has finished and then give us the total byte count as an integer. And we can just print out this byte number. And then after all of this happens, we can call set state and push the file here into our cached file. So we want to make sure that the download task happens first, and that's why we're running this little execution first. That way we actually get the file after we've downloaded the new information into it. Now down inside of our container here, we can say instead of path does not equal null, we can say cached file does not equal null. Then we create an image asset instead of an image network, 
and we put in our cached file.path instead of our path. Otherwise, we create that empty container still. Inside of our floating action button, we can now alter this on pressed function and make it so that it calls the download file function. So we say await download file and then we pass in our underscore path variable. So now if we reload the application, you can see here we've got our three files. If I click on one of them, it will send that file into our storage. And then when I click the floating action button down here, the file will now appear inside of the box here. We can send another file to our storage, click the little button here, and it will then appear here as well. And we can do the same with the last file, and we can then download that last file. I know this way of doing things was a little inefficient in some places, but I did want to showcase most of the functionality of storage, as well as how you can cache files and things like that. Alright guys, well I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike the video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.